Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Na Krishna Hare. Hare Hare Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, 
Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Hare. Hey Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Sum up them. <laughs> Take it down. Hare <laughs> <laughs> Krishna. Very ecstatic Kirtan Maharaj. Thank you very much. Drowned in Ansin Kirtan Rasa. So today is the most awaited session. Uh, Maharaj is going to speak about his Russian preaching exp experiences. It was a very tough time. In Russia, Prabhupada visited once for uh, a week. 
and in that week uh, prabhupad made one devotee initiated a devotee and then later on eventually the whole hari krishna explosion happened and uh, so many devotees uh, became in russia and maharaj has been instrumental in uh, preaching in russia as it has patri prabhu was telling that maharaj break the broke the door and then gave it to many devotees to preach in russia so we would like to hear maharaj said there is going to speak about the history of russia and also how the preaching expanded and now so many thousands and thousands of devotees in russia so hari krishna maharaj om agyana timirandasya gyanam jana salakaya takshurun militam yena tasmay shri gurave namaha shri chaitanya mano vishtam stapitam ye nabhutale svayam rupa kadamahyam dadati svapadandikam vandeham shri guru shri yuta padakamalam shri guru vaishnavam shcha shri rupam sagrajatam sahagana ragunatam vitam tam sajivam sadvaitam savadutam parijana sahitam krishna chaitanya devam shri radha krishna padam sahagana lalita shri vishakhavitam sya e krishna karuna sindho dina bandho jagat pate gopesha gopika kanta radha kanta namostute tapta kanchana gaurangi radhe vrindavaneshwari vrishabhanu sute devi pranamami hari priye vancha kalpa tarubyascha kripa sindu byevacha patitanam pavane byo vaishnave byo namo namaha shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri advaita gadadhara shri vasadi gaur bhakta vrinda hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama 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 hare hare namo vishnu padaya krishna prishtaya bhutale shrimate bhakti vedanta swami niti namine namaste saraswati deve gauravani pracharine nirvishesha shunyavadi paschatya deshatarine <clears throat> Hare Krishna So we will try to explain something about uh, Prabhupada's Russian mission <laughs> uh, its initial stages gradual development and uh, present state of, the, of affairs but <clears throat> to understand better uh the situation in russia and uh, how the preaching evolved and uh what was russia or soviet union at that time when shila prabhupada arrived in 1971 by the way this year it will be 40th anniversary of his arrival to russia uh 
no, 50th, 50th anniversary of his arrival to Russia. <laughs> so it's very appropriate to speak uh, in this year about this. But before, uh, for you to understand, I will a uh, little bit touch Russian history because uh, some of you may not know uh, the historical circumstances. Uh, you probably know that in 1917, in the beginning of the 20th century, in Russia, there was a communist revolution. And uh, at that time, uh, communists took the power uh, over a uh, whole Russian country, and it was a very difficult uh, transition uh, because communists wanted to do everything from scratch. They basically eradicated the previous culture and an essential part of any culture in any country is religion. Russia was <clears throat> for many, many, for three centuries before, Russia was a Christian country. And there was quite a few uh, Christian saints. It was very religious country for some time. But by the time of uh, communist revolution, of course, religion was in decline. Uh, people were somewhat disillusioned uh, in uh, religion. And uh, communists took advantage of it. And they actually uh, purposefully wanted to completely erase religion from the, uh, from the memory of people even. <clears throat> Lenin. Uh, was the leader of communists who uh, took over Russia. And uh, Lenin, he was devout atheist, and he said that, you know, we will make all the people atheists here. Everyone. <laughs> and his successor, Stalin, a very cruel dictator, he actually said that by 1930, there will be not a single believer in the whole of Russia, in the whole of Soviet Union, not a single believer. So there was a very intense propaganda. Uh, they kind of uh, gave up on old people. They said, oh, these old people, anyway, they will die soon. But young people, they shouldn't believe in God. They should not have this idea uh, of God. I remember very well, I was born in 1956, and from my kindergarten, from very early age, I was told there is no God. The brainwashing started uh, with the children when they were four or three years old, and it was an official, uh, very strongly imposed doctrine. There is no God, and there was a proof. You perhaps know that the first spaceship was uh, uh, arranged by uh, the Soviet Union. Gagarin went into space. And um, very strong proof of the atheist was there that Gagarin went to cosmos to the sea god. So therefore, <laughs> he's not there. <laughs> As if he was supposed to hang there and wait for Gagarin to come. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that was that was the <laughs> the story. Uh, so what happened next? Actually, because people need to believe in something, so they made Lenin as a, some kind of pseudo god. They put his body in samadhi. There was the whole institution, some, you know, probably around 1,000 people working so that his body would not deteriorate. They put him in, the, in a glass uh, coffin, and people would come and worship him. And, uh, uh, you know, the slogan in the Soviet Union was that uh, Lenin is eternal. He's still living. He's there in the coffin, you know. Don't worry, he's, he's there. And they were doing everything possible to make an impression that he's eternal. You know, they were putting all kinds of cosmetics on him, on his dead body, you know. The dead body was deteriorating anyway, but they were trying. So there was anyway, 
you know, they they wanted to eradicate religion, but at the same time they introduced uh, pseudo religion with pseudo God, <laughs> who is in the tomb there in the Kremlin. And people, you know, I remember still in my childhood. And when Prabhupada actually went to Russia, it was still a very much of a custom. People would stand in a queue for three, four, five hours just for one second of darshan of Lenin in the tomb. <laughs> so religious they were. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, they went to Lenin's Samadhi, so-called Samadhi. Just for one second of darshan, they were ready to spend four, sometimes five hours in a, in a very cold weather, freezing cold, going in, into this tomb. And they were only allowed to be there for one, you know, two, three seconds to see, oh, eternal Lenin is here. <laughs> you know? So this is how, how crazy people can become. They invent some God. Srila Prabhupada always jokes in this, you know, they, they kind of appoint a God, you know, Ramakrishna is God or whoever is God, you know, Lenin is God. So, and then start worshiping. And of course, and the end result is frustration. So what happened uh, during Stalin, the successor of Lenin, he, uh, uh, achieve, he didn't achieve the goal. By 1930, still there were believers and somehow rather miraculously, spontaneously, uh, people, despite of all this propaganda, despite of all this brainwashing, and it was heavy propaganda. It started in a, uh, it, it would start in the uh, kindergarten, then in the school, practically uh, um, all the time we were told, no God, no God, no God. Man is coming from the monkeys. That was the official concept, you know. You are nothing but monkey without a tail. So that's the only difference. Besides that, there's not much difference, you know. If, if you put a tail, you will be like monkey. So, and then uh, in, the, uh, in the colleges and universities, it was even more heavy. Because those people who were in the universities, they were supposed to be leaders of the country. So they were making sure that there is no theistic ideas in the minds of people. Despite of all these endeavors, despite of all this uh, uh, saying, you know, still people would believe, still people would go to church. But it was strictly imposed by the government that no young people were allowed into the church. <laughs> You know, old people, okay, but young people were not allowed. When I was in the university, it was around the time when Prabhupada came to Russia for you to uh, have a taste of what Russia was like. Uh, uh, you know, there was, uh, in, in my batch in the university, Moscow State University, there were um, around 250 uh, young uh, men. Uh, and women. Uh, so among this 250, one dared to admit openly that he believes in God. Within two months, he was expelled from the university. He was kicked out from the university mercilessly. Just his only crime was that he said, you know, maybe he's there. <laughs> maybe God is there. So that's was the country where Srila Prabhupada came in 1971. <laughs> you know, nobody was supposed to believe in God. Uh, Bible was completely prohibited. You would not be able to buy Bible or to get Bible or whatever. It, it was unheard of. Uh, and Prabhupada, he always wanted to come to Russia. He's very strong desire was to come to Russia because he came to many countries, but he didn't come to Russia. And at that time, you know, was the actually pinnacle of the Cold War. Brezhnev was there, was the ruler. He was a good friend of Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi would come and they were embrace each other and kiss each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, but, you know, uh, no religion, no religion whatsoever was allowed at that time. Uh, and uh, as it, you probably heard, there was an iron curtain. 
the country was uh, behind the Iron Curtain, it means that nobody, practically nobody would be able to leave the country and go to the West and very few people were allowed to go into the country only for guided tours or for some diplomatic purposes or whatever. Some purposes were there, but it was very, very much restricted. The traveling uh, from Russia abroad and from abroad to Russia was very, very much difficult, very difficult. You know, sometimes people would have to wait the permission to leave the country for three, four, five years just to leave the country for a few days. Because the fear of the authorities, Russian authorities at that time was that if people go, you know, the propaganda was Russia is the best country. But at the same time, um, uh, there was hardly any food stuff there. Nothing was there, but it's still it was the best country. So to keep uh, this concept or illusion in the minds of people, uh, they uh, would not allow people to go abroad because, you know, if they would go abroad, they would see that there, there are some, at least food stuff in other countries. <laughs> How is it the best country? <laughs> so the official doctrine was, this is the best country. Uh, everything else is just rotten and goes to hell. We are only going to heaven. The heaven will be here very soon. Without God, of course, with Lenin as, as, as our appointed God <laughs> uh, on earth. So uh, therefore they, they had to do it and to impose this strict discipline. Now, uh, you know, there were advantages of this. People were humble, people were, um, you know, people were not into so much into consumerism. Uh, actually, <laughs> there was very good things there in the Soviet Union. <laughs> Sometimes I regret that it's not there, you know, of course, without all these restrictions, but uh, people were really nice and uh, actually people were spiritually thirsty. This whole gigantic experiment which was done by the Russian authorities, by the communists, actually is the best proof that religion is a, a very intricate part of human nature. Because for 75, or I don't know how, yeah, yeah, probably 75, 74 years, uh, there was no religion allowed. There was no notion of religion. There was such a heavy propaganda. But as soon, the moment when uh, everything became open, everyone became religious again. <laughs> Didn't work. You know, they, they, were, they were stretching, stretching, stretching the rubber and then they let it on and the rubber went back <laughs> to the natural stage. This is actually a very good proof that religion is natural. People are believers. Whether you don't believe or believe, you believe. <laughs> you may think you are atheist, but deep inside your heart, you're a believer. I was, you know, brainwashed since my kindergarten. Still, I was praying. I didn't know to whom I was praying, who is this, but still I was praying. And when it was tough time, I was praying, please help me. Who is there to help me? I didn't know, but <laughs> the, the, the nature is there. This is the nature of the soul. And the soul is a part and parcel of Krishna. The soul cannot be happy without God. Therefore, uh, in, uh, you know, in, in any shape or form, religion must be there. And even in atheistic Russia, they made a pseudo-religion to fill the vacuum. Because absolutely without religion, people feel empty. There is emptiness in the heart, which they can only, you know, uh, eradicate by drinking vodka. That's the only way. Um, uh, you don't know vodka, so it's whiskey. Oh. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the way to feel the vacuum, the emptiness in the heart. And Prabhupada, he wanted very much. He had this uh, idea and uh, uh, many times he tried to get visa, but it has, as I said, it was difficult to get, even as a tourist. But of course, Prabhupada didn't want to come as a tourist. He didn't want to come for sightseeing. He didn't want just to 
entertain himself in Russia. You know, he didn't have any of such business in his mind. He wanted to preach. And he tried to get visa, but unsuccessfully. Oh, I, I don't really know, because tourist visa for foreigners was available. I don't know about Indians, but for Western people, it was possible. But Prabhupada, of course, didn't want to come with the just a casual visit. He wanted to preach, and therefore, somehow or other, he got in touch with this Professor Katowski. Uh, about whom you probably heard. And Professor Katowski is a very interesting figure. He's, he's the grandson of one of the uh, fathers of Soviet Union, of founding fathers of the Soviet Union. His grandfather was a great military hero during revolution time. There are still monuments uh, in him. So uh, this Professor Katowski probably was the worst person to speak about religion in the whole of Soviet Union, besides Brezhnev himself. So, <laughs> but somehow or other by Krishna's arrangement to emphasize Prabhupada's glory, <laughs> how Prabhupada could use even Professor Katowski <laughs> in the service of Krishna. Uh, Krishna arranged uh, his contact with Professor Katowski and uh, the started some letter exchange. Uh, you know, Prabhupada wrote something to Professor Katowski. We are, Professor Katowski was an Indologist. He was a uh, quite famous um, scholar, uh, a specialist in Indology in India. And uh, Prabhupada wrote him something about some subject matter. I don't know what. Prabhupada initiated the, uh, this exchange, and Professor Katowski very politely wrote him back, and Prabhupada wrote again, and Pr Professor Katowski wrote him back. And uh, in the second or third letter, Professor Katowski casually mentioned uh, to Prabhupada, uh, in case you happen to be to visit uh, Moscow, please come. I would be happy to see you and, uh, and converse with, with you, speak with you. Prabhat took this letter and said, I'm invited to Moscow. <laughs> he was not really invited to Moscow. In case you happen to be there, it's not very you know, open invitation. <laughs> if you happen to be there, please come. So Professor Katowski wanted to be polite, but Srila Prabhupada used any opportunity. <laughs> he said, you should just, you just sneak there <laughs> anytime. So, <clears throat> you know, sometime before somebody said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, there is a chance to go to uh, Moscow. Uh, and it was winter time. And winter time in Moscow is very severe, right? It can be minus, minus 10 easily, minus 20, minus 30. I mean, it's freezing cold. You know, Madhumati Pushkarini, Nirmal Krishna were there. And they said that in Russia, there are only two seasons. It's uh, white winter and green winter. <laughs> From the Indian standards, there are two, way, two, two winters there. It's like in Bangalore also, there are two seasons, you know, rainy season <laughs> and, and something else. So, <clears throat> and some, you know, the, the first chance for Prabhupada to go to Russia was in winter. And somebody said, Prabhupada, there is a chance to go to Russia. And uh, there was at the same time, simultaneously, there was another invitation for Prabhupada to Hawaii uh, during manga season. And Prabhupada immediately said, I'm going to Moscow. And, you know, devotees started saying, Prabhupada, don't go to Moscow. It's too cold and it's too miserable and it's, it's communism. Go to Hawaii. Prabhupada said, preaching in Moscow is sweeter than any mango in Hawaii. That was Prabhupada's taste for preaching. He actually, he was living. He was, you know, his preaching was his life. <laughs> He was getting, you know, blessings of Krishna by preaching, and he knew that this is his mission. So he wanted to come to Moscow uh, for preaching, and he had some hope that Professor Katowski will arrange some programs with students. 
He actually, he knew that it was hopeless to speak with Professor Katowski, but he, he had some uh, hope that uh, something will be arranged for him to speak with the students. He came and he <clears throat> visited Professor Katowski. Professor Katowski was uh, formal, polite, but formal. And of course, he said, there's no question of uh, any student program for you. Prabhupada had some conversation which was secretly recorded by Shyama Sundar Prabhu. Shyama Sundar Prabhu had uh, a recorder with him and he secretly recorded this conversation. And when Professor Katowski found out about it, he was, he was furious. <laughs> But of course, this was too late. It was already printed in Signs of Self-Realization. <laughs> <laughs> and back to God hidden everywhere. <laughs> so in this way, Professor Katowski became very famous. <laughs> of course, he, that was the last thing which he wanted because it was dangerous for him. You know, the, the, what I want to say is that if you practiced religion at that time in the labor camps, in the prisons, uh, labor camps, prisons were full of religious people. If somebody would become a sincere believer, uh, it was a very good chance that he would be put in prison, uh, especially for preaching. You know, there was a special article in the criminal court of the Soviet Union uh, specifically for such uh, cases. You know, uh, basically this article was saying if you preach religion, you would be put in prison, but um, it was camouflaged. It was kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 literally it was said that if you propagate some uh, views which are harmful uh, for uh, Soviet people and for for their health, uh, then there was a, you know, you will be detained for uh, up to five or six years, I think, in prison. So if people would start preaching, then, you know, actively, they would they would be put in prison on the basis of this article because it was would be very easily, you know, um, the case would be made that this is some harmful propaganda, propaganda which is not very good. So, and of course, devotees in the West, they knew that Russia is, is a very atheistic country. And therefore, Shyamasundar Prabhu, who arranged the visa for Srila Prabhupada in Bombay and who accompanied him, there were only two people together with Prabhupada, Shyamasundar Prabhu and Aravinda, uh, his servant. Uh, so, uh, Shyamasundar Prabhu, he was, he was very strict. And when he was putting his things in a suitcase, he made sure that there was no religious picture, there was no religious books, there was nothing there. And he's um, young, uh, naive, and very dedicated and devotional wife, Malati. She thought, my husband is in Maya. And she secretly put big Bhagavad Gita into his suitcase. He saw that, she saw that uh, the husband is in Maya and he forgot to take Bhagavad Gita. How you can go somewhere without Bhagavad Gita? You have to have Bhagavad Gita. So, uh, uh, it was a big surprise for Shyamasundar Prabhu because uh, on, the, uh, on the border, the customs would very thoroughly search through the, all the things and belongings. And if there was something religious, it would be confiscated immediately and you could be put in prison also for this crime of trying to sneak in the country something which is forbidden. So Shyamasundar Prabhu, he almost had a shock. He almost, he almost fainted when uh, uh, the custom officer opened his suitcase and the first thing which he saw was Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know that Bhagavad Gita was there. <laughs> he started shaking in his shoes. <laughs> he, didn't know, he, he didn't know what to expect. <clears throat> so uh, this is actually Krishna's arrangement. This is how Malati was instrumental to bring first Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita into Russia. 
So, but she very lovingly put there a few pictures of their young daughter Saraswati, and there were photos and pictures were there in the Bhagavad Gita. So this uh, uh, custom officer, he opened uh, this book and he wanted to see what is this book, what is it about? And of course, he didn't know English, so it was not so easy for him. But <laughs> still, you know, the pictures were there. <clears throat> but when he took the book and uh, opened it, uh, all the pictures of Saraswati uh, fell down. And he, he felt a little uneasy and he felt a little ashamed and he started apologizing and he said, oh, this is your little daughter, please forgive me. He put all the pictures inside the book, closed the book and said, go. <laughs> 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 this, is, <laughs> this is how the first Bhagavad Gita went in <laughs> Russia. <laughs> And Prabhupada didn't have Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada very innocently went there. So, you know, he was an old man, of course. <clears throat> so, yeah, Prabhupada met with Professor Katowski. Prabhupada was not very impressed by Professor Katowski. And I believe Professor Katowski was not very impressed by Srila Prabhupada. You know? <laughs> they, they were completely opposite people. But what happened later, you know, <clears throat> Prabhupada was trying to preach to him Krishna consciousness, to preach to him this concept of Krishna, Bhagavad Gita, or whatever. Professor Katowski said, no, no, no. This is not for me. This is not for my people. This is not for my country. This country, you know, people in this country don't believe in God. We will never accept all these religious ideas. And, um, you, know, mm, you know, that was it. So many years later, in the um, 1990s, in the beginning of 90s, when we had the first temple in Moscow, Professor Katowski came to our temple. He was invited. We invited him because we knew that he met with Prabhupada and uh, we happily welcomed him. We put some garland on him and we you know, arranged some nice prasadam for him, and he was sitting, and he couldn't believe his eyes. You know, everywhere there was people in dotis, <laughs> with tilakas, <laughs> you know, and at that time it was a peak of book distribution, everyone was busy running here and there, and there were, you know, the whole temple was swarming, and there were hundreds of devotees there, and at one point, Professor Katowski started crying. He really started crying, he said. He couldn't believe his eyes. He said, when I spoke with Swamiji, I never thought that his mission will be successful in my country, but I was mistaken. <laughs> so this is, this is Prabhupada's vision. Prabhupada, he knew that there is something special going on to be there. Therefore, he wanted so much to come uh, to the Soviet Union and he finally came and from external point of view, his visit was not very successful. You know, he spoke with Professor Katowski. He went for sightseeing because there was nothing to do, you know. And he, he could sit in his hotel room and chant or, you know, I, ultimately they went for sightseeing. And Prabhupada, <clears throat> uh, they went to some little hill uh, which looks over Moscow city. This is the place where Moscow University is there. And, uh, you know, I was not there at that time, but uh, it was just, just a couple of years. If, if I was there, you know, just a couple of years before, I, would, I couldn't theoretically meet with Prabhupada. So Prabhupada, it was June of 71, uh, 20, 21st of June or something like this. Uh, 22nd of June, I believe. Yeah, 22nd. It's actually also very interesting. <laughs> it's a very interesting uh, coincidence, if there is coincidence in, in this universe. But 22nd of June, this is the date which is known to, um, at least it used to be known to every uh, Russian citizen, because the 22nd of June, uh, uh, was the day when Nazis Germany attacked Russia. When the Second World, not Second World War started before, but Russia was involved. The, the Germans entered 
uh, Russian or encroached Russian borders on 22nd of June. And it so happened that Prabhupada also came on 22nd of June. I remember uh, Sri Radhanath Maharaj once was giving a lecture and he said, Napoleon wanted to take over Russia, he failed. Uh, Hitler wanted to take over Russia, he failed. Srila Prabhupada came to Russia and he conquered Russia. <laughs> so he came on the same, exact same date. <laughs> of course, it was not pre-planned, but uh, still, it's, it's a peculiar detail of the whole thing. She, uh, Krishna wanted to show how to, you know, to, if you want to conquer something, you have to conquer their hearts. <laughs> and Prabhupada, he came, not with this military uh, campaign, um, but he came to conquer uh, over the hearts of people by love, by Krishna's love. He was the messenger of love and he came and he was actually successful. So when he was in this guided tour and he was over, uh, uh, he was looking in the, con in the Moscow city from, from the top of the hill, and Shamasundar Prabhu, he said, at that time, he said, there will be time uh, when there will be tens of thousands of people together chanting the holy name. <laughs> that was the prediction in 1971, which was absolutely unbelievable at that time. In 1992, yeah, in 1992, there was a big concert arranged by devotees uh, with, um, um, I forget his name, Boy George, with Boy George. Boy George was a part of this concert. He was somewhat uh, close to the devotees. And there were 30,000 people attending this concert and chanting together, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So it was only, you know, 20, 21 years later, <laughs> when Prabhupada's prediction was fulfilled. He said specifically. And also at that time during this visit uh, in Moscow, Prabhupada said, uh, he, he saw that, you know, the whole country was actually under the fear. There was a lot of military policemen were there. Prabhupada liked Moscow in one sense because he said it's a very clean city and Moscow was really clean at that time. It's not like this now. <laughs> it's still quite clean, but not uh, that much. But at that time it was really clean and Prabhupada liked it very much. Every, every morning in Moscow there were special machines with water and some you know, special uh, equipment to clean all the streets. <laughs> It was really clean city with, with a lot of, you know, uh, greenery and everything. Uh, but still, there was a lot of military uh, around in the city. And Prabhupada said, you cannot really keep people under the fear all the time. He said, uh, you know, in 20 years, this country will be finished. That was Prabhupada's prediction. In 1991, according to Prabhupada's prediction, the country was finished. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, you know, that was the, that's the power, Satya Sankalpa, whatever pure devotee wants, Krishna fulfills. Uh, and you perhaps read about this, uh, you know, Shyamasundar Prabhu was standing in a, in a shop to buy some rice or whatever, some food stuff, whatever little was available at that time. And uh, <clears throat> there was somebody standing behind him. And this somebody who was standing behind him started whispering in his ear. Uh, do you know something about yoga? You want to tell me something about yoga? And Shama Sundar Prabhu became ecstatic. <laughs> he thought, oh, this is Krishna's God sent, you know, opportunity. I will go to... Srila Prabhupada, and he took the, everything, he took the number and he said, yes, 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 definitely, definitely, my, my teacher is there, he's a great yoga teacher, he will explain everything to you. And he came to Prabhupada, back to hotel and said, Prabhupada, somebody wants to know about yoga. Prabhupada said, this is secret police, don't go to him. 
<laughs> if you go to him, you will be arrested. <laughs> Prabhupada saw through <laughs> immediately. But then there was another <clears throat> occasion when Syamasundar Prabhu again, he was uh, walking in the street of Moscow and he was walking in a dhoti, which was unheard of. You know, especially uh, white skinned person in a very exotic dress. Uh, and um, uh, at that time in Russia, and there was very valuable few, you know, because there was very little things that things, especially Western things were not available. So there were uh, something which was very valuable and there were a category of people, a class of people who would uh, earn their living by meeting with the foreigners and asking foreigners uh, or buying from the foreigners uh, some, you know, some valuable um, goods from the West and then reselling them, uh, you know, two, three times more expensive to Russian people. So there was, there was a category of people who would make living like this. They would hunt, uh, you know, they, they would know English. Uh, at that time, hardly anyone knew English. These people would know little English at least. And they would ask, do you have uh, like uh, uh, Beatles, uh, how you call this? Uh, records, yeah. Do you have Beatles records? Beatles records were really, I mean, if you had original Beatles records, you could make fortune for this <laughs> uh, record. Or blue jeans. Blue jeans was also a very valuable commodity. You know, so... Shema uh, Sundar Prabhu was walking on the street in one of the central streets near Kremlin. Uh, and uh, one young man approached him. And he, this young man was together with an Indian. And this young man asked him, do you have blue jeans? He said, no, I, do, I have my daughter. I don't have blue jeans. <laughs> do you have Beatles records? He said, no, I don't have Beatles records. But I have my guru. Oh, you have guru? That's interesting. <laughs> so... <laughs> At least something, you know, <laughs> no Beatles records, no blue jeans, but at least Guru is there. So, so may, maybe, maybe there is something. So this is how Prabhupada met with Ananta Shanti. Ananta Shanti initially wanted, um, you know, something uh, which he thought was valuable and he got something much more valuable. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, Shyama Sundar Prabhu brought this young man and together with Indian to Srila Prabhupada and this young man very, uh, you know, inquisitively uh, listened to Srila Prabhupada. He happened to know English, which was really rare. Again, I mean, to meet somebody on the street there who was not a KGB agent, who knew English and he, who had an interest who knew quite nice English because he could understand and relate to everything to Srila Prabhupada. It's practically, it was practically impossible. Practically impossible. <laughs> but Krishna made this arrangement and Prabhupada uh, was, uh, uh, you know, was, Shyama Sundar Prabhu said that uh, he never heard Prabhupada speaking so strongly as he was speaking to this young Russian person. <laughs> He said, I heard Prabhupada in many, many occasions, in many temples, he was speaking always, but and that was probably the best of Prabhupada because Prabhupada wanted to put all his heart into this young person's heart. <laughs> Everything which was there, which he knew, which he wanted to give with such a conviction and such, such strong desire. <laughs> So, and therefore this young man, he was like a sponge. He was, he was absorbing everything in a very, uh, in a very, you know, amazing way. And later Prabhupada said that, <clears throat> you know, the cook, when he wants to know whether the rice is ready or not, the pot of rice is ready, he takes one grain of rice and he sees if one grain of rice is ready, then the whole pot is ready. And he said, I see by this man that this whole country is ready to take Krishna consciousness. <laughs> that was Prabhupada's judgment. <laughs> he saw the reaction of this one man, and he was right, because as I said, when Russia 
and became open, uh, then uh, very quickly people who were thirsty for some spiritual things, they, they started taking Krishna consciousness, Christianity, so many other things. Uh, and uh, at that time, you know, there was Hare Krishna explosion, as uh, Suvarna Gaur Hari said. But that was later, that was in 1990s, when, when the country opened. Or, yeah, end of 80s, 1990s. But before that, before uh, the country was open, uh, there was another chapter of uh, Krishna Consciousness Movement in Russia, very sad chapter. This uh, young person, Anatoly, his name, Anatoly Pinyaev was his name. Uh, he became Ananta Shanti. Prabhupada gave him initiation by mail. And uh, he became in regular contact with devotees. Prabhupada, at that time, what Prabhupada did, he told uh, all his uh, leaders, to go to India via Russia, via Moscow. <laughs> you could make a stop in Moscow airport or sometimes, you know, uh, spend a day or two in Moscow. So the, the devotees would secretly, frequently visit Moscow after Prabhupada's visit. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> and they were, you know, maintaining contacts with Ananta Shanti. Ananta Shanti was meeting with them secretly. And of course, very soon, uh, it uh, was known to the secret police, to KGB at that time. And uh, uh, he was watched, uh, but nevertheless, he would get some, you know, Tulsi beats or whatever, and he started preaching. And the next uh, very significant step was in 77, when or even 76, no, I think 77 was the first time. When Gopal Krishna Maharaj for the first time came to Moscow uh, with uh, Bhaktivedanta for the uh, Moscow Book Fair. Every year there was a big international book fair in Moscow and different uh, publishing houses would come to Moscow and uh, had their stalls there and uh, gave their exhibition and, you know, people would visit them and sometimes converse with them. So Gopal Krishna Maharaj in 77, when Prabhupada was still there, in May of 77, for the first time he came to mm, Moscow uh, with uh, Bhaktivedanta Book Trust and with the uh, with, uh, with the books of Bhaktivedanta Book Trust and they had a big stall and it was very successful. There were, you know, there were hundreds of people coming because the, you know, the books were so special. They were so bright and a lot of pictures and everything. And you know, the people. But unfortunately, people didn't have money to buy. And uh, uh, Gopal Krishna Maharaj was kind of puzzled whether he should give books or he should get money or whatever. He got some rubles, but rubles were useless. You know, you couldn't really change rubles for dollars or for any currency. It's uh, also like Prabhupada, we always say that Prabhupada came to America with what, 40 rupees or what? Seven, seven dollars or something like this. But you know, the 40 rupees was not seven dollars, 40 rupees was zero dollars because you couldn't exchange these 40 rupees for dollars. <laughs> you know, you couldn't use this. 40 rupees. Uh, somebody still has this 40 rupees which Prabhupada brought with him to America. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, what happened actually this um, book fair, uh, the roommate of mine, uh, he visited this book fair and he got a book and he got acquainted with the devotees and this is how I became a devotee ultimately. <laughs> So this is how it, it happened. I was staying in Moscow State University at that time, and he first became a devotee. He first became vegetarian and started chanting, and then somehow or other he involved me, and here I am 40 years later <laughs> uh, talking about this. So, but what happened, uh, because of the books, because of preaching of Ananta Shanti, because of all these people who were 
uh, devotees who were coming. And actually, Prabhupada also, what he did, uh, he sent uh, Mandakini Devi, uh, his disciple uh, from France, uh, to Russia. And he said to Mandakini Devi, you go to Moscow and you marry Anantashanti. Because uh, if you had a foreign wife, that was the only way to get out of the country. And Prabhupada, he, he at least had a plan or he saw that it's dangerous. But, you know, Anantashanti himself, he uh, asked Prabhupada, is it possible for me to get a foreign wife? And Prabhupada said, no problem, we have many girls. <laughs> but this is amazing, this Mandakini Devi, she's coming now regularly to Russia and preaching all over Russia. And uh, she's really an amazing person. And, uh, you know, uh, without even thinking twice, she went to, you know, Prabhupada said, you go to Moscow and marry somebody from Russia. And she went to Moscow and married somebody <laughs> from Russia. <laughs> you know? Of course, it didn't really work, but uh, uh, but nevertheless, it's it's a very, you know, good illustration of how uh, first disciples of Srila Prabhupada were completely 100% uh, sold out to him, completely dedicated. They were ready to do anything and everything for him. That's this devotion to uh, to Guru, which is glorified in Shvetashvatara Upanishad. <laughs> uh, so, uh, because of this, the, the devotees started coming new and new and new devotees. It was very easily, actually. It was really easy to make devotees at that time in Russia. Uh, it was not difficult at all. You know, uh, people were thirsty for something spiritual. If you would tell them something, they would be very, you know, easily involved. Especially kirtans. You know, Russian devotees, they still love kirtans. Uh, <clears throat> Niranjan Maharaj, when he first came to Russia, and uh, it was not only... Niranjan Maharaj's experience. Indra Dhyumna Maharaj was also one of the first preachers. And Gopal Krishna Maharaj, of course, was probably after Srila Prabhupada. Oh, of course, Hamsadutta went there. So many leaders went there. Uh, Gopal Krishna Maharaj was one of the first ones. But they all had experience, you know, when the first programs, when, when Russia became open, little open, you know, there were still programs in the apartments. And, uh, you know, there was little apartment, maybe one room apartment, just one room, not even one bedroom, one room apartment. Uh, and um, there were 50, 60 people jammed into this, into this one room. And they would sit for three, four, five hours completely jammed, listening for the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. Every, the, every preacher who, is, who was there at that time, he still remembers that it was just something unbelievable. Here, if, you know, in any temple, when you come, please finish your class at nine o'clock sharp, not one minute more. <laughs> Especially in the West, it's very strictly imposed. <laughs> in Russia, they would speak two, three hours. People were completely in a, in a very stuffy room where there was no air to breathe. They were still sitting and listening because they wanted to know. They wanted to know what is it all about, this life and God and everything else. So what I mean to say, even before it was open, uh, uh, Krishna consciousness started spreading like wildfire. You know, I remember those days, you know, uh, you would speak a little bit with somebody and somebody would become really inspired. Really? God is there? Tell me something more. <laughs> How can I know? What shall I do? <laughs> you know? It was, it was really interesting. And I, I was doing my, at that time, I mean, I graduated from Moscow State University. I was doing my postgraduate studies. I was doing my PhD degree. <clears throat> yeah, and, you know, at that time I started chanting. Uh, uh, so uh, the KGB, which is secret police, the intelligence, not intelligence, secret police, the uh, police, uh, started really worried about this strange, exotic movement, which 
which is, you know, spreading like wildfire. Now, in, uh, later in, I think it was in, yeah, in, in, in mid 80s, when Russia was still quite closed, in the mid of 80s, there was, a, there was an article published in one of the central uh, magazines in Russia. And this article was written by the head of the KGB at that time. And he was analyzing the political situation in Russia. And he said, there are three main threats coming to Russia for our system, for our country, for our communism. Three main threats coming from the West. One is rock music. Um, I don't remember what was, the, what was the second one, but the third one was Hare Krishna. <laughs> so <laughs> it was the threat for, for the whole, whole system. So the reaction was, of course, very vehement because uh, they were really worried about uh, this. They didn't know what to do, how to deal with it. The only way they knew how to deal with it is just to put everyone in prison and to stop it and somehow rather to just really stop it. So uh, in, uh, in, in 77, there was this book fair, which actually gave very strong push to the development of Hare Krishna movement in Russia. And we know that in 77, Prabhupada passed away from this world. Uh, Few times, I think three times, Gopal Krishna Maharaj would come with the book fair before the police found out what is it all about and stopped this whole thing. But it was too late because there were so many books already there. Uh, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam from this Bhaktivedanta Book Trust because Bhaktivedanta Book Trust was an official you know, member of this whole uh, book fair. And so many devotees were there. And in 78, in 77 it happened, in 78 uh, in uh, uh, Moscow, in the headquarters of KGB, of the secret police, they formed a special department to fight with Hare Krishnas. <laughs> special secret police department to, you know, to stop this, <laughs> Hare Krishna movement. And uh, in uh, 79 already, uh, in 79, no, it was in 80, in a, sometime in 80 or maybe 81. Anyway, uh, the, they started uh, some uh, court cases against the devotees. They put first two devotees, then, then more devotees, more devotees, and ultimately, in different parts of the of, of Russia, and at that time, but uh, uh, unfortunately for them, uh, at that time already, Krishna consciousness was practically everywhere, all over Soviet Union. <laughs> it just spread like like coronavirus. <laughs> because people were so eager to, to get something spiritual. And, you know, so many people started chanting Hare Krishna. Uh, they were having this uh, kirtans and everything. So, <clears throat> from 81, I think, or 80, they started putting people, uh, devotees, in prison. Uh, and altogether, they put to prisons and labor camps uh, uh, more than 60 devotees, around 60 devotees, which was probably, I don't know, you know, I don't know how many, uh, it, it was probably good percentage of the serious devotee population. Practically all, they were initiated by that time, of course, by uh, Harikesh Maharaj Prabhupada's successor at that time for uh, Russia. He was the zonal acharya for, uh, for Russia. And he actually did a lot. He and uh, uh, North European BBT, uh, they were spending a lot of money. Uh, North European BBT was under him. So they were spending for this Russian program a lot, a lot of uh, money to actually maintain this program and this preaching. They were helping a lot. Uh, so, 
Mm, all these devotees, uh, and you know, Kirtiraj Prabhu, Prabhupada's disciple, he was in charge of this program. He was a glorious fighter. I will tell um, something about him a little later. Of course, there is no time, but I can go a little more. Uh, so, uh, it was very difficult time. And I still remember this time because I started, you know, I started changing around that time, around 1980, uh, when I started changing. And I remember whenever I would meet with, uh, with a devotee, it was, you know, uh, we always were, we, we were half Krishna consciousness, uh, Krishna conscious, another half KGB conscious. You know, there was this split personality <laughs> syndrome. You know, we were trying to think about Krishna, but we were also thinking about KGB because they were watching us. And, you know, and we, we talk half of the time, we talk about Krishna, and half of the time we talked about KGB, what KGB did, you know, because they were, uh, you know, encroaching people's homes, confiscating all the literatures. Uh, every now and then doing some search and sometimes, you know, detained uh, people for two, three days. And, uh, you know, they were putting people, as I said, started, started court cases. There was a wave of court cases. And uh, uh, it was, you know, um, Russian prisons are probably, I don't know, I've never been to Indian prisons, but uh, I think they're at least as bad as Indian prisons, if not worse. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was really difficult. Some people were put in, some devotees were put in psychiatric hospitals and were put heavy psychotropic drugs, uh, you know, and including Ananta Shanti. Ananta Shanti was put and uh, detained in psychiatric hospitals for a few years. And because of the so-called treatment, it, it, it affected him severely, unfortunately. But there were people who even died in labor camp. And the most glorious one was Sachi Sutta. You, you read his story in, uh, in Salted Bread book. He was a book distributor from Armenia. Mm, and he was very young, he was 21 at that time. He was put in prison in a labor camp. And, uh, you know, if you're put in prison in a labor camp, you cannot say, I'm a vegetarian, please give me vegetarian diet. <laughs> you know, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> so he could only eat some bread with salt. There was nothing else. For a couple of years, he was only eating this bread, and sometimes he would even share this bread with somebody else because people were starving. And uh, he, at the end, he died out of malnutrition and starvation in the labor camp. Uh, it was also very cold at that time. Uh, and, you know, you, when you don't eat, you're very sensitive to cold. Uh, so what he did, uh, he, the people who were there with him, they were really amazed by watching him. This is the miracle which Prabhupada created, how he could, uh, you know, they didn't, they have never met with Prabhupada. They have never met with, you know, they met with maybe with Ananta Shanti, or maybe not even with Ananta Shanti because Ananta Shanti was also put in prison. They met with some maybe young devotees from there. They maybe read some of Prabhupada's books at that time in Russian. But the face was so strong. He would not eat anything which would even touch meat there, even though he was starving. He was completely, you know, the, the, his body was deteriorating. And ultimately, uh, he said to his, uh, you know, cellmate, uh, not even cellmate because it was a labor camp. They had to heavy work during the day uh, without any practically any nourishment. Uh, so he said, I, I, I will die. I'll probably die. And what he did, uh, he wanted to die as a devotee. 
And of course, there was no tilak at that time. So what he did, he took a, a toothpaste <laughs> and he put tilak with the toothpaste on his body and the 12 parts of his body. And he put some, you know, bed sheet, uh, new bed sheet or whatever over his, uh, you know, as a doti and something. And in this way he died because he wanted to maintain this, his identity as a devotee. And he was ready to die, uh, but not, you know, not to deviate from, from the face. It's very difficult for us even to imagine. Here everything is free and, you know, if you want to practice, you practice, but nobody wants to practice. <laughs> but there, <laughs> you know, people were, uh, you know, they were under a huge, threat and, uh, and they were practicing and they were dying for the face. So he was the one. Another one was um, Premavati. She was put in prison. She was a girl uh, or a young uh, woman at that time. And, uh, uh, you know, a baby girl was born to her. I think it was in prison when, or maybe uh, the baby girl was just born and still she was put in prison. And this baby girl, uh, after two months, died in prison. And at that time, the Russian program uh, headed by Kirti Raj Prabhu and Harikesh Maharaj at that time, uh, you know, they started a very strong campaign all over the world to make it known. Uh, Kirti Raj Prabhu uh, did everything possible and impossible to, he met with the heads of states, with the presidents, with Queen of England, and to everyone he was telling, look what is going on in the Soviet Union. Innocent people who are vegetarians, who are not harming other people, uh, who are, you know, just believing in God, they put in prison and they're dying there. He started a huge campaign, uh, you know, free Soviet Hare Krishnas. There were demonstrations, devotees would go uh, out in front of the embassies in all the capitals of the world. Uh, on appointed days, and they would demonstrate free Soviet Hare Krishna, free Soviet Hare Krishna in front of Soviet embassies. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it was a big campaign, amazing campaign. Uh, you missed it. <laughs> but uh, at that time, it was, it was the talk of the whole ISKCON. And um, uh, um, Prahlad, the famous Kirtaniya singer, uh, at that time, he was young. He was maybe nine or ten years old, and he recorded. There was a record, a recording of a uh, song. I don't know. It, 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 was it him or somebody else uh, uh, wrote the poetry, and uh, he sang a song, "Mr. Gorbachev, free my friends, free my friends, <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, free Hare Krishnas." And there was a you know, Hare Krishna there. And uh, uh, in Australia, they did it. And there was a big press conference. And it was really a big event at that time. And uh, then they somehow or other, they went to the prime minister of Australia. And prime minister of Australia, and they gave him this record where a little boy uh, is in a very, you know, angelic voice is singing this song, Mr. Garbhari, my friends. And uh, they say that this uh, uh, prime minister of Australia, he started crying when he heard this song. And he personally called Gorbachev and he started pleading to him, please, please, please do something about this. And that was the first one. And then uh, Ronald Reagan, he spoke with Gorbachev. And of course, at that time, it was already Gorbachev and the country would become a little more free. And uh, this is how this whole chapter more or less ended. But uh, nevertheless, it was a very tragic and difficult, difficult chapter. 
difficult time when devotees were suffering. Um, but at the same time, nobody even thought of giving, Hare, giving up Hare Krishna. <laughs> and everyone still would preach. Despite of all these threats, despite of all these dangers, uh, devotees uh, would continue preaching, um, you know, as if nothing could happen. Uh, and uh, the more pressure was there coming from the government, the more uh, devotees would preach. <laughs> and the movement was still uh, spreading. And um, <clears throat> actually, some say that, you know, like uh, when Kamsa uh, was oppressing uh, Yadavas before the advent of Lord Krishna, then Narada Muni went to him and said, you know, do it more. <laughs> Why did Narada Muni say this to him? Because he wanted to finish the guy <laughs> quicker. <laughs> he knew that the more uh, atrocities he would do, the quiver he will be ended, he will be finished. So this is what happened actually with the Soviet Union. The, there is definitely... Hare Krishna's contributed to the fall of the Soviet Union <laughs> in an indirect way because these people were so foolishly uh, persecuting the innocent devotees. Uh, you know, my friend who was also put in prison, the friend who made me a devotee, he's, he's living in America now. He told me a very funny story. Uh, when he was... Uh, uh, when the case against him started and the court case against him started, uh, the secret police, they arranged for some uh, fake or false witness. They spoke with one lady and, and they probably bribed her, gave her some money and said, you please come to the court case and you say that, uh, you know, th these people, they were preaching to your daughter and your daughter became crazy or something like this. They, they, they were trying to make a case against him, against my friend and a few other devotees who were living together with him. Uh, <clears throat> so this lady came to the court as a witness. She was invited by the, uh, by the officials and uh, they said, we have a very strong witness against these people. And she started, you know, making a story. Yeah, these people came and they were preaching. And actually, she made up the whole story. She said, uh, they were telling me that you, you should, you know, sacrifice your daughter. We will make a sacrifice of your daughter or something like this. She was making a heavy story. And the devotees were sitting there and listening to this. And they were thinking, you know, what is happening? <laughs> Uh, it's a heavy, you know, it's a heavy situation because it's such a heavy accusations. So, and they were preaching about God and uh, she was saying, and the lawyer, uh, the, which was there with the devotees, she was a very smart lady. She stood up and she said, your majesty, can I ask this witness a question? So she said, yes, please ask the question. So, uh, and she asked very innocently, uh, which God uh, did they speak about? And because at that time, nobody knew about Krishna. They only knew that there is only one God, Jesus Christ. She said, Jesus Christ, of course. <laughs> <laughs> And the whole thing failed. <laughs> so, they arranged, but they didn't arrange properly. So <laughs> they didn't inform her about which God they should speak. So this is just some little taste. But it didn't really, of course, didn't, uh, didn't hinder that. And they still put my friend in prison, despite of all these false things. So, yeah, and then Gorbachev came in power and he started freeing the country a little bit, little bit. Perestroika was there and, uh, you know, a few devotees were released. 
No, you know, but most of the devotees, they stayed in prison three, four years, and it was very difficult, really difficult. Some of them told me after that that we didn't know how, you know, whether we will survive or not. Every day we were counting. And, you know, it, it, it was luckily just practically only such a suit and this little girl uh, and, you know, somebody else in, in a psychiatric hospital also was... Uh, was uh, died he died uh, and uh, yeah when uh, when the country was free then the new chapter started and uh, and uh, in the beginning of 90s there was a huge explosion as i said there was this boy george concert where um, 30,000 people were chanting together in moscow and uh, there was a huge book distribution i mean uh, amazing book distribution the country was so poor at that time people were poor and there was no cash uh, so uh, people would not get salaries they they couldn't get salaries because there was no cash there was huge ec economical crisis so the uh, the devotees book distributors sankirtan devotees they would come to a factory huge factory uh, with you know a couple of thousand people working in the factory and all these people they they don't get salary so they would go to the uh, bookkeeping office of this factory and he said they would say you know we have these books uh, you know you don't have to pay us cash you can you know transfer money on our bank account we can take uh, this money from you uh, why don't you give to all your workers uh, these books the set of books to all your workers and sometimes they would distribute you know within a couple of hours uh, you know two thousand or one thousand sets of Prabhupada's books <laughs> wholesale <laughs> Uh, because, you know, people, uh, they couldn't get money, at least they could get Prabhupada's books. That's, <laughs> that, was, that was a good deal. <laughs> you know, they would not get anything, but uh, at least they could get something. And uh, uh, really, at, at that time, it was, it was easy. The book distribution was so easy at that time. I remember I was in Marathon. Uh, you know, and the people would come, I, I would stand with some uh, little table with the books and somebody would come and I would start preaching to him. And this uh, person, uh, oftentimes they would say, shut up, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to tell me. <laughs> I want to take these books anyway. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so this is how it happened. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, then there were so many other things, but I, I guess for the beginning it's enough. <laughs> Maybe some later we will tell something else. Okay? Because I'm already talking long ago. Long. Okay? <laughs> hmm? It's already quite late. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, what happened after that, it's, it's interesting. The whole, hist you know, the historical lessons are very interesting. Uh, this initial enthusiasm was there and there was a lot of Devotees, there was this a lot of explosion, mm, and uh, you know, in, in Moscow and Saint Petersburg, the temples were opened and everything. But then, uh, uh, it's not that easy, <laughs> you know. The, some internal problems came, and uh, devotees started losing enthusiasm. Also, uh, uh, you know, this uh, it's uh, it's still material world. It's Russia, but it's still a material world. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, so far to the moment, uh, I think it was at least uh, 
25, if not more, million books were distributed in the whole of Russia. So it means that uh, every uh, tenth person has a book, or you know, 10% of the population, or maybe even more. You know, so it, it, it's uh, probably in every other family there is a book of Prabhupada. <laughs> uh, and there was actually a radio station. And uh, in, in the beginning of 1990s, there was a special Hare Krishna radio station, Krishna Loka. There was the radio Krishna Loka. And um, it was one of the most popular radio stations in Moscow. Uh, around uh, one million uh, people would listen uh, the programs of the station every day. One million people. It was a really good radio station. Unfortunately, we couldn't maintain it because it was a very <clears throat> expensive affair. So we, uh, we couldn't continue with this program, but it uh, lasted for how many years? For five years, yeah. Five or four years, there was this radio station, very popular. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, but then there was crisis. <laughs> In, uh, uh, in Moscow, it was a very difficult time. And uh, uh, Harikesh Maharaj, he changed something you know, in his mind and it was very difficult also. Uh, but many devotees, and I was thinking about it, why did it happen? Uh, when Prabhupada came, of course, everything was so glorious and, uh, you know, his vision and his uh, prophecies, they were fulfilled and everything. But then uh, why this, uh, this crisis all of a sudden? You know, there was thousands of devotees at that time in Moscow and all of a sudden, you know, this happened and, uh, you know, there were just... Just a few devotees, not a few, but, uh, you know, probably half of the devotees left in 1998. It was a very severe crisis. And I was thinking, why it is? And then uh, I came to a very important conclusion that even though there were so many people uh, attracted to Krishna consciousness movement, uh, when the movement became so big and so influential in one sort of way, uh, you know, there was a lot of social pressure. When the movement becomes big, uh, there is some social pressure. Uh, and there were a lot of people who were kind of devotees externally, but they were not really uh, devotional internally. And this is what may happen also in India, you know, when the movement grows and grows and grows and grows at one point, you know, it kind of, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's like fashionable to become a devotee. Everyone around me a devotee, you know, why not to become a devotee? It's a good group, it's a good social uh, uh, gathering arrangement. Uh, and um, uh, you know, I, I could physically, even physically feel that because of so many people who were not really, uh, who were losing their internal connection with Krishna, but still maintaining their external appearance as a devotee, the whole atmosphere became spoiled and it was difficult. So Krishna did a brilliant arrangement he just, just by one stroke, he said, you're free. Please turn on your brain. Turn on your intelligence. You turned off your intelligence. Uh, you are devotee, not because you really believe it in, uh, within your heart, but because everyone else is there and because you're just blindly following. What happens, and that's a big danger, you know, when, when the movement or spiritual organization becomes, uh, you know, popular or big, then there is a lot of blind followers. And these blind followers, it's a big burden. It's a big burden for Krishna too. So Krishna said, no more blind followers. I don't want blind followers. 
you place blind followers, either become, you know, again, um, see again <laughs> and decide or go away and do something else. You, I don't need blind followers. So that's also a very uh, significant part of the whole history of Russian preaching of Srila Prabhupada's mission. And, <clears throat> you know, since that time, of course, uh, you know, many, many uh, years passed and uh, the movement spread even more, it became stronger after that. And uh, so many Russian people are joining uh, Krishna Consciousness is con all over the world. Actually, in America, in uh, England, in Europe, um, everywhere, even in Japan, uh, Russian people joining is <laughs> uh, It's less in uh, German is There is less native Germans than living in Germany Russians. It's mostly Russians and Indians, and few Germans are there. Even in Japan, there is a lot, <laughs> you know, in Japan, there's not so many Russians living, but somehow or other, even in Japan, they, uh, they managed to join this code. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the vision of Prabhupada. He, he knew that somehow or other, this is this Krishna consciousness movement, by, by some arrangement, it's, it's very... Uh, conducive or it's very uh, coherent, uh, harmonious with the Russian uh, psyche or Russian un you know, understanding. So people are joining still. We have now uh, big preachers who have also millions of followers and uh, so many people join. But that's entirely different story. So let's keep this katha. Uh, as it is now. That's enough. <laughs> so that was little historical explanation of what happened in Russia. Thank you very much. Sila Prabhupada ki. Gaura Premanandi. Hare Krishna. Jai. So it was a long cherished desire to hear this whole story. We had just heard that Prabhupada went and then preaching happened, but the details many of us did not know. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for enlightening us on this topic. Somehow in India, Krishna consciousness is so easily available. You go walk a few meters, you'll get a Krishna temple. If here, Vishnu temple, Shiva temple, so many. And holy rivers, holy places, holy sages, but uh, still we don't take it uh, very seriously. <clears throat> there were few medical students and medical workers who were working in Russia. Nirmal Krishna is one of them. Madhumati Pashkarini was also there. And there were quite a few medical students from India who became devotees in Russia. And one of them said, I became a devotee in Russia. I went back to India. And he says, there is no Krishna consciousness in India. Only in Russia there is Krishna consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his <laughs> understanding. I don't know. <laughs> I don't agree with this, but that's I'm quoting him. <laughs> yes, Maharaj, but so much opportunity is there, but uh, we don't take it seriously yes, because we are allured by the complacent. Western. We become complacent because it's so easily available. Mm -hmm. the, since our childhood, we keep seeing Krishna photos, Krishna, hearing Krishna's names. So many so, stotras, but still we take it as a ritual and not take yeah, it Yeah, actually, one very important lesson is that we should not be complacent. We should not be, uh, we should really appreciate what we have, the gift of Krishna consciousness. It's a rare gift. <laughs> and people who, who are deprived of this gift, they, they appreciate it very much. So please also try to appreciate the opportunities which you have. Deities, temples, devotees association, everything is prasadam, everything is freely available. <laughs> You're very lucky. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. His Holiness Bhakti Vignan Goswami Maharaj Ki Jai.